this week's Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn was hosted by Sherry McGurnahan, uh, who led us in a very spirited discussion about Agile and how Agile is not working, uh, in her opinion, or why it's not working. Um, and we had people push back and agree, and it was a one frontal discussion, uh, just like most of our sessions are. Uh, what I've done is I've put the session first, and then our Hangout stuff I've put at the end, so you can still listen to us chit-chat if that's of interest. Um, and then if you know other speakers or people who want to participate in the Lunch and Learn, please, please invite them in, let me know, uh, and I'm happy to expand our list. We have some amazing uh, speakers and guests coming up and in the past with recordings that you can watch. Thanks. Um, and then Sherry, you're going to, you have, you're on deck to talk, right? You, you I'm on deck to talk. Yep. Right. Awesome. Uh, um, I see. Um, so the uh, I didn't prepare any any slides. I sort of went back and forth, and I kind of thought that this was a topic that was really good um, in the same fr uh, frame. I left the door open so the dog could go in and out. Now I've got a fly. <laughs> um, but I I decided to sort of follow um, Keith's lead from last week. Keith number two, who isn't here with us today, I don't think. Um, uh, and just have more of an open discussion because I think this is a really good um, topic for that because it's I think it lends itself to a lot of back and forth if that's if that's cool with everyone uh, the sides that I, I used in the past for this have been when I'm introducing what agile is and I think everyone in the room is is well aware of it um, versus what everyone thinks it is which is you know very different for you know for what uh for what we uh what we know so that was my thought for today I would, i'm looking forward to that discussion uh we've actually gotten to a point where where we get sometimes a toxic reaction against uh agile <laughs> in, our, in our in our teams yeah so cool we got a good healthy group to discuss it how do you want to how do you want to tee it up um, so I was just going to make, gives, I have a little spiel. Um, Miles interviewed me recently and actually I heard my, my little soapbox in my job interviews. <laughs> they still, they still hired me. So there you go. Um, as, uh, as, and Keith also uh, a little bit has heard it. Um, uh, and I think even Jeff has heard it also uh, in, in my chats with him. So I apologize for a bit of repeat, but so agile, my background, by the way, uh, just, FYI is is project management. I've been working with DevOps and Dev teams now for probably longer than I should admit, but definitely full time since 2008 when I came back uh, from living in New York into Montreal. And at that time, I was hired as a, a senior IT project manager, so a technical project manager. So the difference there being, you know, wireframing and things like that. And I quickly became someone that was really good at solutioning for clients and sort of bridging that gap between um, the tech end and the, uh, the dev team. So even though I'm not a developer and I've gotten this question a lot, how do you run dev teams if you're not a developer? And I don't, you know, I, I always have a team lead obviously, but at the same time, you know, I don't need to be the smartest person in the room. I need to know who the smartest people are and give them the tools that they need to do the job. So one of the things that has come out in the last 10 years that we've been doing this is everyone has been getting on the different methodology bandwagon. And one of the things that has come definitely in the last five years on a, on a big sort of ramp is how do we, everyone wants to be agile because everyone wants to be able to respond to customers super quickly and Sales wants this now because now, you know, this client is going to pay a premium for it, but R&D wants to do this and how do we plan and how all this. The agile methodology in its infancy, it has been around for a long time. It's been around since, uh, I should have looked this up before, but uh, 50s, I think. But the, it's meant as a continuous development cycle right? And I won't go, we all know what that, uh, what we mean by that. But the problem when you move that over to a software and you take it out of, let's say, a factory setting or a pure engineering setting 
is that it doesn't allow for the thoughtfulness that you really need in a um in an organization definitely a smaller and again the bigger the organization the harder it is going to be to have a pure agile process because what's going to happen is you know your ceo or whoever is going to come down and say hey we need to be agile right we need to be agile so we can respond and doing this and they have zero idea of what that means right and by the way anyone jump in here right um especially um um especially josh who i know <laughs> okay <laughs> but the by doing that two things happen i think um and I, i've seen it in, in practice one is I believe at the core teams need goals, but they also need to be able to celebrate when they finish something. And two, we need to document and we need to have reflection time. And by being in this continuous cycle of trying to be constantly in that agile um mode there isn't enough time to do those two things effectively and i honestly believe the bigger the team and the bigger the uh the company it can actually lead to burnout and losing your devops team mm. one of the other things that happens in that agile thing and a lot of people don't like this and 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 as i always say all of my devs all of my team everyone's they're all snowflakes they're all snowflakes and they're brilliant snowflakes but they're snowflakes so you've got some people that are super great at being microman or being managed very closely which is required in that agile framework right you're constantly checking in you're doing your scrums you're doing your stand ups um but if you have people that don't work well that way and you're constantly feeding them stuff and they're never they don't have enough time to get their head around it then they're actually not going to be as productive as you want them to be. So by sort of combining these things you end up with a bit of a perfect storm of everything not coming together and actually moving away from your end goal which is to produce software or a product that is stable that has documentation that can be rolled out with a level of client satisfaction and a way to like breathe and like move on to the next thing can i can i ask a challenging question then um the do do the roles of weekly sprints user stories and regular stand-ups um do, do you not see those as facilitators of um you know creating that thoughtful space and that opportunity to to maintain focus um so because that gives you uh the short term goals that lead to the the long term outcomes right so it's you know it's it's breaking breaking the big thing into consumable pieces um i do 100% but uh, i'd ask you a question back when was the last time you actually saw a useful user story oh mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Dang>. <laughs> that hurt <laughs> no it's fair yeah it hurt me it hurt me yeah I, and i'm not i'm not put i wasn't staking a a claim in the ground on that i was um, no but that's the yeah. problem right is this is the problem if people were given the space to do things properly right but the problem is we're so focused on turning things out right and somebody comes down from you know the office on the 7th floor and says we need to go agile and by the way i need you to get this out in like 3 weeks because if we don't we're going to lose that deal yeah. so then you know that's where that's where the problem is because they don't understand what putting in that agile in in one way if you're putting it in properly you're actually slowing everything down a bit and saying okay let's actually look at our user stories let us let's actually look at our documentation and what we need to build this but the problem is that what's happening is people are you know agile is not a one size fits all and that's the other big thing the problem with it is that everyone thinks it's this one size fits all and it's not mhm mm and most people are using agile in 
some combination of a, of a hybrid. And I think that is yeah. super good because like, for instance, I was very much agile slack. I, I worked in sprints, right. With, with, um, with legal suite, we worked in sprints. I tried to get user stories as best as I could, you know, um, and R and D tried as well, but, um, we were more working in a slash waterfall method, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think if you actually went in and audited most companies, that's probably what you would find because they are doing sprints. They are doing their Kanban boards. They are, you know what I mean? They are doing their, or Trello or whatever else they're using, you know, and trying to at least put some framework around it. And I think that's fantastic because before it was just, let's throw everything at the wall and see what sticks and then go with it or which client is screaming the loudest. And the smaller the organization, the more driven you're going to be by your sales team. Right, Keith? <laughs> well, well, I, 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 it's interesting as you say that. I, I guess the question I have is, and I think in your earlier statement, mm -hmm. um, is why does a company go agile, right? So the, the interesting thing, when I, see, when I hear someone says the executive team came down and said we're gonna go agile, you know, my biggest fear is that they were on a plane and they talked to someone or read an article, right? And they said, oh, Agile gets you to the future, <laughs> right? Which you, everyone, everyone here has experienced the IT yeah. by article of airplane ride, right? Um, which is the fastest waiting yeah. to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's funny because I always ask myself, well, why do you want to go Agile? Because we want it faster. We want our cookies faster. Okay, um, what's the right speed? They don't have an answer. We just want it faster. And well, what do you think are the problems to why you can't deliver faster code? And they go, well, development says it's the, the infrastructure team that it takes them 45 days in order to put a uh, you know VM together, yada yada yada. We went to a more agile way. We would get infrastructure being built out while we're developing the code, yada yada yada. And you have the infrastructure say, well, it's because developers know, never know what the hell they're doing, right? They, they are always changing their mind. They, they give us crappy code. There's no quality to it. Da, da, da. And QA is going, yeah, and no one includes us. They just throw it over the wall and hope we, you know, we make out miracles. To me, the reality is I wish people would throw away the freaking term, which they really have, because no one does, to your point, does agile to the whole thing. And all, when you start looking the safe and all the agile frameworks, I'm like, who the hell wants to develop code like that anyway? It's, it's too process oriented, right? Well, exactly. Yeah, I I, I wanted to point one thing out real, real fast because we're dancing around what I think is at the core. The, the core is that um, we have worked to try to find a way to, pro, uh, to turn the development of software uh, in, into like a manufacturing process, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're wanting to churn out widgets God, I hate that I use the word widgets because of the bad memories that that invokes. Um, but but that's that that's what's happened, right? We we've, we've looked at the development of software and applications, and we and we wanted to treat it like it's an assembly line, right? In order to optimize it, and I think the net result is is that we've lost. I think this is to to the point you made. As a result of that, we've lost that uh, creativity. Um, that subjectiveness that's that's associated with how you put that together like there 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 is an art there's some artistry into the engineering of software and and how software is created and 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 put together and I think to your point we're we're, we're losing that is, is is that a like a, a bigger I, 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 summary yeah, I think it is I think we've, Josh I think to your point I think we've lost it because you have you know Technology is the only discipline that has two diametrically opposed skill sets, right? You have the artistry of Picasso and the scientific method of an Einstein combined in one brain, right? Um, and, and, and so think about the, you know, how crazy that is, right? And then you have a business that says, well, why are we paying so much for technology? Why are the technologists people take so long? We can't, marketing says we can never get anything done at a time in which we can estimate, you know, we want to have a deadline to say we have a release going in spring and all of a sudden we can't, we don't know what we're going to get. And they say, well, it may not happen. Why can't we get a reliable delivery system? And I think it, to your point, if we focus on making quality software um, that 
matches what the customers want, that brings value to the marketplace, and advances the way we deliver the solutions in a quality way. I don't care if you use waterfall, extreme programming, pair programming, freaking whatever you use, iterative, which all of this to me is a derivative of anyway, um, rational, please come back to us. Um, you might actually get to the point, to your point, Josh, which is focus on delivering quality deliverables to production in a way that accelerates the process. Yeah, and I, I think I think you got closer to to the uh, to the problem statement in that each of these frameworks that are being applied are being applied for different reasons. Yeah. Right. For different outcomes. Right? Well, they're and, they're also being applied without actually owning those frameworks. They're they're being applied in a uh, here read the manual that says do step one, do step two, two, do step three. The the culture is not being accepted. I mean the whole assembly line thing that's lean manufacturing as opposed to yeah. agile. But yeah, you know, we're we're doing agile washing here. And uh, to go back to the statement of when was the last time you got a good user story? Well, who's your product owner? And uh, Agile, uh, people forget that you need a product owner on the team, mm -hmm. that these are teams. And especially with ops, DevOps, DevSecOps, all the rest, the team tends to work in a firefighting mode in the past. And when you're applying new techniques and new thoughts and new ways of doing it, especially the first time through, if you don't have a commitment to take the time necessary to get the new way of doing it down and internalized, every time there's a problem, you fall back to the firefighting. So there are lots of issues here. Um, one of the things I find most irritating about Agile is if you start with a foundation of heavy technology, debt, crap, infrastructure, yeah. you're not going to be able to do anything but create more spaghetti even with Agile. Exactly. And then if you don't separate out, and I went through this, if you don't separate out the the spaghetti, right? And say, okay, you guys, you guys are going to focus on the bug fixes of everything crazy that we've got right now. And then you guys over here, you're going to work on putting in this new framework. You're going to work on like ironing out these processes so that we understand and that it's the processes are not going to be um, a, a ne negative equity, if I can say it that way. Yes. So that we can actually keep going through and eventually these guys will come back into the cycle and then we'll all be one big happy family. But the chances of organizations letting you have the space to do that is really difficult. And I understand that. I understand because they have to keep the lights on. Otherwise, none of us have any jobs, right? We get that. But, you know, it's, and it's, it's definitely a, a fight that I've been doing for the last 12 years is trying to like find that balance between the two so that you you're not hurting your team and you're not burning your team out because it, when everybody's in firefighting mode all the time you're just going to get burnout and you're going to get very unhappy devs who never feel like you know they're they're never doing quality work or they're constantly working on old code to try and fix something because god forbid we pull the wrong piece of code and the whole thing's going to be a jenga game right that's the other thing. So it's, it's how to do that. And my, per, my personal approach has always been split it almost like my giant hosta that I have on my back. I have an elephant hosta. It's massive. So what do I do? I split it. And then, you know, by getting buy-in is really difficult because you're also at that point, possibly slowing down your, your, your market releases. So it's, it's how do you, how do you balance those two? 
But the, this to me is a discipline issue for, um, if this is sort of just the way we've gotten addicted to delivering software where marketing is promising things that are coming, not or things sales. that are delivered or sales. Yeah. Um, I find marketing even, even more problematic from that perspective. Um, and I, you know, one of the things the that, that we, we've highlighted, sorry. It depends upon the product as to whether it's sales or marketing. Right. Uh, but, if, if it's uh, actually delivery of software to other people, it tends to be sales. On the, um, on the more service oriented architectures, marketing has more of an impact. But when salespeople are out there trying to get their uh, commission, they promise the, the world, the moon. Yeah. And everything and, else. <laughs> and, 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 well, I've and I've worked at I've worked at I've worked at places where the devs over promise, where they say they can get it all done by a certain date, and then as you get closer and closer to the date, they keep pulling back and back and back until there's nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's not I, just and that's that's well, normal. Really I mean, the, the challenge with agile promises. is that we we keep it, it <laughs> makes it super easy to it interrupt long term flows. Right. This is where the things we're describing here are, are more discipline issues than process issues. Right. The if you go back like to the goal or to Phoenix Project or something like that, it's the expediters who are actually the ones causing the problems. Mm -hmm. And what you're what you're describing is expediters, the lack of discipline. Agile. This is I, I saw this happen like at Dell. It was horrible. Um, I try to be really careful at Rack End, but it's way too easy to say, "Oh, I have this wafer thin feature. Slip it into this process because the process is being opened up every two weeks," and that you know. Uh, Sherry, I think to your point, drives you away from process improvement, paying down technical debt. A lot of these things that require you to have a lot of discipline to say, all right, wait a second, I need to interrupt, you know, the expediting and, and pay down some debt. Um, and it's, well, it's a huge problem. Yeah. Well, on I mean, some of that, I think um, going back to the agile methodology, now the daily meetings, it's not the daily meetings where that sort of thing would come in. It is the retrospective where you sit there and you plan out the next sprint and the planning, is, the planning goes out the window because it's dictated that this other user story goes in there and you don't have a say in the matter of what's in your sprint. So yeah, that's the thing, but it's it, the retrospective is probably one of the hardest things to get right. And mm -hmm. that's where real, the real planning happens and the real saying no happens. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of these problems would go away if we would just get better at forecasting. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> well, there is that. That and the lotto ticket numbers. Um, but the well, I mean, no, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I, I, I no, want to drill into that because yeah. it's, it's super hard to do. Yeah, because anybody, anybody, and, and, and we've talked about this from marketing, we've talked about it from sales, we've talked about it from business, we've talked about it from developers. Everybody has said it. At the root of at the root of the big challenge there is is that we do a poor job of understanding when we can actually do how much we can deliver and when. Mm -hmm. okay, like, so for, forecasting that. forecasting when when something's finished. Right, and so I use. Yeah, and, and I, this is one thing I, I coach my team on, and, and when I mentor people, I, I remind them on, um, and, I, and I do it two different ways. Number one, I use Bill Gates' view of, um, and, and he nails this, people overestimate what they can get done in a year and underestimate what they can get done in three. Mm -hmm. And I, I use a great example of that in braces, right? The objective of braces is having a nice smile, right? And you don't go from having a messed up mouth, which I had, to a, a, not, a, a nice smile, which I used to have. Um, <laughs> you don't go to that in one shot. You don't do it in, in a short period. There's, there's constant adjustment. There's pain along the way, <laughs> right? There's discomfort as, as you do it, but you, you, it's that long-term objective, knowing where you're looking to be at a, around a certain amount of time and making sure that every activity is incremental towards that end goal. Mm -hmm. right? So this is and all that, easy. So that, that pulls off some of the forecasting, yeah. right? Unless you right. have, uh, unless you put in place an artificial end date, right? Or a contrived like end, end date, then 
you know, everything suffers. You look at movies and you're like, you know, if they would have had three more months on that movie, it would have been a better movie. Happens all the time, right? And it's because of poor forecasting <laughs> and, and a, an artificial end date. Or so, yeah. budget. I mean, it's right, if, if you're building software and you can't get it into the field and get people using it, you, and you really don't know what you're building, right? Mm -hmm. And this is right that I, although my team has become toxic towards MVPs, um, and I can explain why we went through that process because a lot of people like them. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very delicate balance, right? You build something, you put, some, put it in somebody's hands to start playing with it. And if they like it, and if you built it, you know, with, you know, without thinking about scaling it, then, then now you've got a problem where they're, they're using something. If you thought about building it with scale, you might never have launched it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't, striking that balance is, is incredibly tricky. Well, and, and that's the, you know, that also goes to the heart of what I w was saying earlier, which is that when, when all of a sudden, if you do think, you know, about the scale and then somebody comes along and then says, oh, we have to add this to the next sprint. We have to add this, you know, then it, it can absolutely take you off on another fork that, yeah. you know, had you known to do this, it, you would have built it a different way. And that definitely comes from my infrastructure side for me, you know, um, and that's, you know, th that's also where people end up getting tripped up. And then you end up throwing out a whole bunch of stuff that you just spent the last three sprints trying to do because nobody bothered to think, oh my God, this is actually where we needed to go, you know? Um, so and I, I tend to, blame is a, a bad word, but I tend to put the, I tend to put the onus a little bit on the product <laughs> owner there because they're the ones, in my experience, that are great the product owner slash sales have always been the one in my life that have always been the easiest suede of what path we're on and that's always where um the and i come from a, a company that was about 100 ish people right so all of a sudden now there's you know, this new contract and this new client and they need this now when we were going to plan it in three months because we needed this other infrastructure in the back end in place to be able to do this, but now we have to move it up. You know, so yes, agile, as people are saying, lets you shift gears if you need to, but it also can really hurt you in the end because by the time you get to where you thought you were going to get to in three months, the infrastructure you've now built or the back end that you've now built to support what you had to release urgently is now useless so you're actually going back into that negative technology again that negative debt again well you always i mean i think part of it is you always have debt There's yeah impossible not to accumulate debt. i i mean the what i, I want to make sure i heard you right because you said something that, I, that I, you you sound like you said the product owner product manager is often the one who's the most easily swayed to change their direction in my, in, in, cause I will, you know, in, in, I think, I think that's, I think it's true. I, that's why I was checking with you. It, ideally they're, they're the least easily swayed and they're, but yet they aren't in, in experience. Right. So if you have a, a really solid R and D department, let's say, right. That, you know, is, is following the process and following, you know, and getting their user stories and holding the sales team or whoever's, even, I mean, a good new feature can come from anybody, right? A good idea can come from absolutely anybody. It doesn't have to come from this person or that person, come from a client. But you still, it doesn't mean you, doesn't, and it often does, but you don't, doesn't mean that negates the responsibility to the organization and to the development team and to all the people involved, the PMs and everyone, to doing those proper user stories and documentation. And in my experience over the last four and a half years, our pro we didn't have a specific product owner and the, um, the sales was very much driving. So it was a sales slash, our in-house counsel was also our product owner in North America. So they were of course also driven by the sales team and the sales numbers and the pressure put on there, right? And this really, you know, 
when you're in that medium size ish company and you're really, you know, it's, it's, it goes back to what I said earlier, about having to, how do you, how do companies strike that balance between we need to be sales driven because we need to keep the lights on and we don't want to lose a contract or we don't want to lose an RFP. But if we pivot, you know, and that's what everyone thinks agile means. Agile means, Agile just means pivoting to the next thing, right? It doesn't, it, 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 that's the last thing it means, as a matter of fact, but of all the things it can mean. It's a misnomer, yeah. So I want to, I want to throw, throw something back in that one of the, one of the things I love about uh, SpaceX specifically was their attitude of continual improvement and their willingness to change what they're doing and how they're doing when the, either A, they find a better way of doing it, or B, realize that the way they're doing it isn't, isn't meeting the objectives that they need to. Um, I think they have, from what we see, it seems that they have a, a strong discipline towards that. And I think that's been a big part of why they've been so successful and let's be honest, a really short period of time, mm -hmm. um, you know, over the last decade. Considering um, they're building rocket ships. Yeah. Well, they're writing a lot of software too. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, you know, they, yeah. they, yeah, right. they did not go in with preconceived notions that they had to do things the way that they had been done before. They had a very ambitious goal. They knew what the smile was going to look like. Right. And here's, here's the part that I think is most important they were willing to throw away something if it wasn't working, right? Um, and, and be comfortable with that. Yeah, it hurts. Um, you know, we did that. It got us to where we are. But guess what? It's, it's not going to get us where we're trying to go. Um, so I, I think that incremental approach of continual learning um, should also be applied in, in what we're doing with software. Um, you know, going to the point made earlier, um, if you try to build it for scale in the very beginning, you never get it out. And if you don't build it for, for scale, then you run the risk of, of it falling over. Sometimes you got to get it out there and know that the next thing you got to do is, is, is work on the scale problem. I think where organizations are often fail is to your point, Sherry, they're not readdressing <laughs> that they, they left something on the table that still needed to be watched. It's like, yeah. you know, hey, you know what? We're, we're starting to hit 80% of what we think is comfortable. It's time to start fixing that scale problem you know, before it becomes like a panic problem. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, listen, I, I was in firefighting mode for four and a half years, literally, you know, doing that. Um, and one of the other, I think, key people that is necessary to keep that eye on the vision, on the smile, as you said, is um, the uh, um, I just completely lost my train of thought. Sorry, is a good uh, a good architect, right? And not having a good architect in your team of you know where it needs where that smile needs to go at the end to 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 take a page from Josh is really what's going to hurt the team because it's them, and that you know you really need your team. Your, your different team members to put up their hand and say, sure, we can do that, but, you know, it will, and then readjust, right? There's nothing wrong with ever readjusting. And that's one of the beauties of Agile, right? Is allows you to readjust. But again, if you're not given that space, if you're not given that, you know, to you, um, to, 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 if you're not given that space to throw that stuff out and not feel like you guys failed because you needed to throw that out, that I think is where a lot of organizations that I've seen have, have dropped the ball because they, they don't look at it as a positive or as a lesson learned. Let's, you know, keep going. They look at it as a, a, a like, like you guys failed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'd like to point out that what Josh was saying about SpaceX versus all of these other companies is that, SpaceX, the product owner is to throw stuff out and start over again to get to his vision. Whereas most salespeople 
will never throw anything out because one of their customers demands that it's there. Mm -hmm. And that's the role of the, the architect is the person with the vision. And that's the person who has to be able to say to management, whatever, we've got to do some culling. We have to do some rework. We have to do some redesign here to get back on track. We need to throw out the stuff that's either no longer useful to us or didn't work and consolidate the stuff that does. But when your product owner is marketing or sales and they're the ones who have the ear of the C-suite, that's where Agile, one of the places Agile falls apart. But it's just an alignment issue. Like, you know, Josh kind of alluded to this earlier when you talked about, you know, we're kind of circled around the problem about, you know, all of these stakeholders in the game of delivering product development, management product, product management, all that stuff. Is it, is it that we don't bring the sales and marketing team, we don't educate them as to the development process? I know some don't care. They say they don't get it. They don't want to. They just want to make money. But is this, I always believe that you can always educate your way out of some of these troubles. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we've had in the product management space is, you know, a lot of companies said, we're going agile. We're making, we're making all the changes. We're getting rid of project managers. We're having scrum masters and all the business analysts are going to become product managers, but we didn't train them how to be product owners and product managers. Right? So is this a training and lack of our lack of alignment so that, you know, and when they talk about DevOps or they talk about agile, the Agile team has a couple of developers. They never put QA in there like they're supposed to. They never put an infrastructure person like they're supposed to. You know, the product manager isn't inside the Scrum. Um, and then, but they don't include marketing and sales in the Scrum so that they see how it's being done and understand that it's not just development for development's sake. There is a, there's a good way and a bad way to create code. And both have their relevant speed acronyms to them, right? I mean, is that what we're talking about, though? Is the lack of alignment and education? I I don't think it was the you know the original premise that was Sher Sherry was putting out, but I think what you're talking about is in uh, sounds a lot like what's discussed in the book Project to Product or yeah Project Project to Product uh, by Mick Kirsten. Um, I definitely recommend that, and and that. Oh, I like that. Yeah, in that he talks about how uh, BMW created their i series, and you know the way that they built their plant for creating the i series was vastly different. Um, it was a completely different operating model. They they changed the way that they were building cars in large part because they weren't trying to produce you know a million cars you know off the bat with it, but um, um, but they're part of what they talk about in the book that Mick highlights is, is that exact alignment, right? Where now the manufacturing of the car is, you know, enables these people selling cars to sell with more options and more capabilities, more in line with what they want to do to be successful um, without overburdening the production line to make the changes. Um, just like, Toyota when they changed the way that what was it they changed the way they were painting cars because the turnaround time was so much that it limited how many options over there that was a misalignment right they, they they weren't changing their processes to meet the expectations of of consumers mm -hmm. I I wonder if we're talking almost about two different things mm. here mm -hmm. in that you know when I'm the filter I'm putting on this is about delivering a software product and which is different, I guess, than just delivering an application into, um, I, you know, I, I actually would prefer that you, everybody thinks of it as product, no matter how they deliver it. Um, but to me, a lot of what we're describing is times when software teams aren't treating what they're building as a product, right? And they're not thinking about the interlinkages. Like, so if you're gonna build something and you wanna do technical debt, technical debt's not that bad. If, you've, if you're not accumulating technical debt at the interface level, but at the level below that, um, right? So there are places where technical debt is okay to accumulate, and there's places where technical debt is super expensive to accumulate. Um, like having a badly designed API and assuming you're gonna fix it, you know, 
that technical debt is super expensive. Having a bad implementation of an API isn't necessarily that expensive because you can fix it without impacting the people around you. Um, yeah. It's really hard to decouple those, but um, well, I a think lot of okay. sorry, I think that's Keith's point though, right? Because if you if you don't understand what you're building it for, you don't know which one's going to be more expensive and which costs you're willing to incur. Yeah, yeah. this is and I this think, to me is I where we can also where, apply. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, Michael. I think we can also apply what you just said to people, to development teams. So someone had mentioned here that agile might work on smaller teams and not lip, not bigger teams. So just like, as you're saying on the interface layer, it's very, um, it's very important to, to um, uh, very important that everything works, but I'm thinking, yeah. but if you have smaller development teams, then if they're not able to deliver something, it has less impact on the rest of the business. So just like a specific implementation of an app, the implementation of an API or a smaller development team, and they can do what they're doing. And then if they fail to deliver, other teams can deliver. I, I'm, I'm laughing because I feel like you just opened up a whole topic about microservice versus monolith. Yeah. Um, that's well, actually and, and I would love to have that as a topic for us to- so We implemented uh, something like Supercell did where we had development teams of like, like mini startups in our company. We have like 15 of them, eight person mm -hmm. mini startups. Our entire company is these 15 person, these eight people, mini companies. And they are, they're on their cadence. And if they don't deliver, another team will deliver on their cadence. That was, I mean, one of the things that, that we really worked hard on in, in the past for, for agile teams was to break up the release cycle interlocks. Um, and one of the things, Keith, I don't know if anybody else is watching the, the chat. The chat. Um, Keith asked me to elaborate on the MVP, and I'm going to turn that into a full discussion because you can't talk, I can't talk MVPs without talking infrastructure as code and generations and, and some of the stuff we did. So I, I'll, I can tell you the history and, and why we think MVPs are not workable. But um, one of the things that was eating us alive in um, actually every project I've done, but it was crushing us in OpenStack um, is that everything that we had had a separate release cycle. And so every time you tried to deliver, you know, your release, you were completely beholden to everybody else's release train and moment and things that were happening. And so you're like, hey, I'm ready to ship this release. And now the you know, that depends on an old version of something else that now is shipping a new version that you didn't test because it happened in the last two weeks before your release. And, and you get these dependency graphs that just make reasonable delivery very, very difficult um, if you don't control all the, all the, the components. Um, and I, I still haven't, the Agile actually makes that worse from that perspective, you have a tendency to say, sure, you know, the new release of, uh, it's, let's set, use CentOS 8, woohoo! Um, and you know, if you don't use CentOS 8, you're, you're toast because now you're, you're, you're trapped, right? That's, uh, these are tech, real technical debt problems. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't, Agile, Agile is, should be better at solving it. Um, my, my soapbox on it is people underestimate the importance of, of automated testing and integration testing. Yes, and that's that's part of the problem is because there's no real um, off ramp in there, right? Um, sometimes for for that when that happens, when something really does go sideways, because there's just this train that you have to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. um, we're almost at the top of the hour. There was one. Yeah. Um, there's a quote that I have um, on my desktop that um, was from um, uh, someone named Philip Crutchin, who's one of the original. Um, reviewers and stuff of, of that and it's it's the agile movement is in some ways a bit like a teenager very self-conscious checking constantly it, its appearance in a mirror accepting few criticisms only interested in being with its peers rejecting on block all wisdom of the past just because it is from the past adopting fads and new jargon at times cocky and arrogant 
but I have no doubt that it will mature further, become more open to the outside world, more reflective, and therefore more effective. Thanks, Sherry. So, you, just, you just described my 16-year-old daughter. Thank you. Well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, I have it on my desktop for a reason, right? And, and be, because I, I don't think we're there where it's become, it, it would be great if it did become more mature, but it's not there yet. And I think, you know, um, to, to uh, I think it was Keith earlier who said, you know, the, the, the conversation on the plane where now, you know, somebody comes back and says, oh, let's go out. <laughs> like, okay. You know, so that's that sort of closes the loop for me. That there is why my soapbox started on this whole thing. That was awesome. Everybody, thank you for the great discussion. And uh, your quote was a perfect way to wrap it up. <laughs> next next week, we have, um, of course, I'm blanking on everybody's names. Um, we're talking about cloud performance. Um, and why am I just because that's what my brain does. <laughs> Paul Teich is talking. He's uh, his company actually analyzes the all the major clouds and, and performs deep scan of like CPUs and analysis and performance and stuff like that. Um, and he knows so much about all this stuff. So we'll have a really interesting conversation. And then I just booked um, the the thirtieth um, with I think. Need to double check what I what I just put. So I will talk. I think we're going to skip the fourth, the week of the fourth. That's all right with everybody. Nobody. I don't. I, <laughs> I don't know if anybody's taking any vacation time, but I think just it, where it it would actually be July fourth. So eh, not going to do it. Um, and that means I'm on the calendar for the eleventh to talk about the MVPs and uh, our journey and why that why that failed for us. Awesome. Um, if you know other speakers, um, we're now booking mid mid July. Uh, actually, no, wait. July fourth is not. By the way, is is the seventh? Is 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 a Saturday? Not. Uh, the next session is the oh, so the thirtieth is sort of July fourth week. The seventh is sort of Ju not July fourth week. Maybe I'll just go ahead and take the seventh. If people want to do that, because I, everybody I see is still working on the, that week of the seventh. No summer, no summer vacations for anybody. I mean, where do we really get to go? Yeah, they just closed, <laughs> they just closed the American Canadian border for another couple weeks, so I'm not going anywhere. Well, July 21st. I'm going yeah. to the mountains next Monday. I just rented my car actually because I had forgotten. Um, but it's like we're going to be in a cabin. I'm going to try to stay away from everybody. I, mean, I don't, I don't like people that much anyway, so. That's what I, I, I want to Except turn off. Except for y'all. I, I love you all. Oh, thank, yeah, I was going to say thanks so much. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one that doesn't like people. <laughs> I, I, can wait. I, I have my virtual high five uh, device. So I, here's, here's your inbound and I can. Oh. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's better than mine. Mine's. Ah. Kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's scary. That's scary. Kangaroo claw back scratcher from Australia. Oh <laughs> we have nightmares. Wow, All right, fun. everybody. This is awesome. Thank you. I'll see you. Thank in a week. you so much. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Just everybody. Hello. Everybody to panelists. There we go. Hello. There we go. You're outside with the doggy. Actually, no, actually, I'm, I'm in a green screen, but it looks. Well, the dog's good. not gonna. The dog's not gonna move the whole. Oh no, the dog moves a little bit. I've been. I'm playing with my stuff. <sighs> Wait a minute. Why does that look like a fake background? Why does that look like a fake background, but yet it's moving? It's uh. I'm using OBS so it can do video. As oh, back, yeah. As backlog. That's so cool. I saw that uh, open repo. Yeah. So, Keith, this is for you. 
Nice. Country Bake Shop. Do you know Country Bake Shop? No, I do not, but I'm assuming it's around here somewhere. It's in Helen, Georgia. It's by the Amish, or I'm not sure if they're Amish or not, but you need to go because everybody should go to this place and have their food. It's insane. I will have to do that. You have to look it up. I'm, I believe they're not open Sundays and they close during the winter because I'm pretty sure it's not heated. I think it's in Helen. Um, but they have the best key lime cookies I have ever had in my life. Key lime cookies? Ever. Cool. Yes. Key lime cookies. Hmm. <laughs> now everybody's intrigued. It has to be like they like key lime pie cookies, like with key That's lime pie it sounds so, basic, like so basically, it's shortbread cookies okay. that have like a key lime flavor, like flavoring in them, and then like a the key lime cream in the center. Mm. Yeah, and then they're sprinkled with um with a. Uh, 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 powdered sugar. Yeah, it's insane. Why am I in the system twice? Do what? Oh, there you go. No, I oh, got I'm it. Moving. Yeah. yeah, people come in as attendees, and I I bring them over yeah. into uh, panelists so that they can do video. Otherwise, it's um, they can't do video. It's all these inherent uh, Zoom default things that I need to see. <laughs> Have a couple of breaches and they go crazy. Yeah, I heard Microsoft um, is trying to. How did someone put it? Be the Zoom killer by expanding how many windows you can have during a meeting because you can only have nine currently. So they want to add more so that they can be the Zoom killer. Yeah, because they're they are, you can't see. A lot of in the in the teams area, but that's nine. Nine, that's it. Yeah. yeah, kind of sucks. My yeah. company uses G Suite, and they just and Google just started pushing out Google Meet yeah. invites mm. for everything. Yes, I like them. Uh, it's just our, the school where I am now is not allowing um, people to use Google. We're Teams or um, something called. Uh, no, Turnitin is the, um, there's like three or four, but that's it. They're only at the, at the college level. Apparently the high schools are using Google, but. My company uses uh, Google like for all of its like um, stuff like the uh, email, we use Gmail and uh, I actually I work for Google. So that's probably one. <laughs> Sorry. It really would have been awesome if you said we use Office 365 <laughs> and I work for Google. Well, the awesome question is, what kind of cell phone do you get allowed to have? Oh, actually, they'll, they'll, they'll give you uh, an iPhone or a Pixel. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. I really I wanted to keep that going longer, but I, I just couldn't. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, oh Moodle. That's the thing they're using. Moodle. It's called Moodle. Yeah. Oh, there's so many freaking products in this world. Is it spelled uh, D L without a D L E or D E L? Moodle. I think it's M O O D L E. Oh. And then right. there's like there's like things you can add on to it, like tune it, turn it in, which is like a way for people to submit their. Um, their assignments and such. Um, and I think it even auto grades it for you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, it do the lectures. I mean that. Yeah, seriously. Well, it's really funny because I, 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 I was on a call today and, you know, um, the, uh, you know, my thought was like, are institutions gonna start realizing th that, um, Maybe we don't need as much infrastructure as we, you know, to, to be effective teaching school. I mean, listen, I still think in-person is gonna, is, is um, way better at, in terms of education on a day-to-day -day basis for high school students. And it's one thing for us if we're doing 
you know, for me anyways, with my security, I do a lot of security webinars and stuff, but I can't imagine being in university full time and just sitting in front of a, a computer all day um, and not interacting with like fellow students and things like that. So I don't think the idea will ever go away that we, you know, need to go to class or should go to class. The first time I heard that universities were going remote and I was like, wow, that, you know, why are people going to pay $20,000 a year for that? And then I looked up the current cost of university and I went, oh, $60,000 a year. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. 20,000 in my country. Uh, Cause we have a really good education. We have, you know, but not only that, I heard, I, I don't know if it was NPR I was listening to, but it was saying that why would you pay $60,000, $100,000 to send your kid to Harvard, right? For when they're sitting on their bed with a laptop. And not only that, it actually now takes the enrollment cap, right? Because before you only had X number of seats. So now yeah. where you only had, I don't know, for argument's sake, 20,000 in the new class, right? Whatever it is, 10,000 new students. Oh, now it could be 100,000, yeah. you know? So then the price of the Ivies, come, like, why would you pay that? But all of the, that cost was all about the facilities, right? Oh, you get a gym with a climbing wall and you get these like, you know, suites and it's like, okay, well, you don't get any of that stuff anymore. So now why is it $60,000? Interesting. You spend all that money to go to a university with a climbing wall and you spend all that money and then you work for a company like Google or like whatever company and they pay you to work at a place with a climbing wall. <laughs> In <laughs> fact, the, the, the Google stuff. office... The Google office I work at doesn't have elevators or stairs. It only has climbing walls to get from floor to floor. <laughs> that's, well, that's, that's not true, but... Uh, that's, I was just going to say that... To cross the, the, the open spaces? Not even that. That's a, uh, that's a class action suit waiting to happen um, for people with disabilities right there. Two things that are coming out of this mess. One, I think commercial real estate is going to take going to take a significant hit, especially in San Francisco, major city, San Francisco, New York. Second, I think it's interesting you said about the, the, the reversal, Michael, of, the, of the, 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 the fact that we now have gone to being paid to go to our office for the climbing wall in a sense. I think you're going to, that, that's one of the interesting things that I think we're going to start to see is that, you know, someone said that one of the founders around the internet said that if they had to do it all over again, there would be a reverse concept. People would realize the value of the data and then they would, Mike, then Google or Microsoft or whoever would pay them to access that data. So the, the funding model would be different. I think that's something that's gonna be changing too is that the funding model for things are gonna change dramatically um, as we come out of this mess, whenever we do. Do you, do you think that's true like with newspapers and reporting and things like that, right? We had the advertising model for newspapers was really based, you know, on a different, completely different thing. And we're getting used to subscribing to stuff. Look at ProPublica, Pro right? Okay. So you're, you're seeing, you're seeing companies come together and say, okay, for global news services, we're going to build partnerships that allow us to source the news and then share that content for reader, right? And then you're right, then it's going to be a different model of subscription based. New York Times, Harvard Business Review, uh, Wall Street Journal have perfected the model enough to know, it's even, even the Washington Post and LA Times has gotten a little bit ridiculous, but they all have perfected that model enough to, to drive a non, that, that revenue being mostly from subscription. So it'll be interesting to see. And the local newspaper still going to take a hit though, and that's the problem. The local news, the local beat. Josh, what is that in the back of you? Josh, is that is 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 that culturally insensitive? Actually, I, <laughs> and you know what? You know what? I just recognized that at this moment. It's the IT crowd. It and is the IT crowd. My thought process was let's do the IT crowd because it's an IT crowd. And now that you pointed out, I'm with you. I'm changing it. it. It's, it's actually no. Not, I think it's, it's fantastic. Not, it's I think not, it's, it's not, absolutely it, fantastic. It's not, Josh is not insensitive, but it is a 1970-ish look. That's kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. It, this the brown the tie really does it for me. The brown tie and the short sleeve shirt. That yeah. 
So yeah. I, I'm, I'm guessing y'all haven't seen the show, The IT Crowd. It's, uh, oh, it's, it's I love it. it. Yeah, it's great. It it's is. hilarious. The uh, the internet's in a little box. What are you talking about? <laughs> yes. I have here <laughs> the of it. The yeah. internet. Yeah. There you go. Um, yeah. I, so I, this is Moss. He's one of the characters uh, in the I show. And there's a fire in the office, and so he fills out a or sends out an email saying there's a fire. Someone please help. And then just sits back because he's <laughs> notified the appropriate authority. <laughs> The ticket yeah. with the appropriate escalation on. Man, that's a great segue into today's topic then. <laughs> Sherry, yeah. you're up there. The, um, it, if, if anyone, if you haven't seen the show, it's a British show and it, I'm a huge Britcom fan, so, um, but it's, it's absolutely fantastic and it's, it's, uh, Miles is joining us today. I invited him, he's one of my, my new coworkers. Um, and he, uh, the, I don't know, Miles, if you've seen it, but it's everything Miles. I've seen every episode. There you go. So it's everything you, you have been living for 35 years at, at school. <laughs> exactly. That's crazy. That's good. Yeah, we're about to queue up. We uh, have a lot of people joining. Thank you. Cameras are optional. Um, it seems like we all like to have them on. And so um, the, uh, I've, I've been cool with that. I'm happy with it, but um, don't feel obliged if you don't want it. 